or in English, Lord Jesus Christ Be Present Now, is possibly the first composition that Disler wrote for what would become his largest collection of choral works, Der Jahrkreis. This performance today marks the modern premiere of this work, which was included in the manuscripts of the collection, but was never included in any of the published versions. This work provides a good introduction to the music of Hugo Disler. No baby pictures, no birth announcements, no happy birthday, no lovingly preserved lock of first hair, nor so much as a passing hidden notice or mention in the newspaper about the existence of the little child Hugo Disler and the first four years of living with his mother. Only three documents, a birth certificate, baptismal certificate, and one photograph mark the cornerstones of his early, early life. Hugo Disler was born on Midsummer's Day, June 24, 1908, at 3.30 in the morning in Nuremberg, and four days later given the name August Hugo Disler in the Lorenz Kirche. These are the words that Disler's daughter, Barbara Disler Harth, used to describe his entrance into this world in her 2000 biography of her father. He was born June 24, 1908 in Nuremberg, he was the illegitimate son of Hélène Dissler, a dressmaker, and August Louis Gotthilfrott, an industrialist and inventor. By age 11, Dissler had begun piano lessons with the intention of entering the conservatory that was there in Nuremberg. However, his upbringing and social standing was a, was a big block in being able to be accepted into the Nuremberg Conservatory. However, he overcame this and was accepted into the Landesconservatorium Leipzig, which is now the University of Music and Theater Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdy in Leipzig. He began his study at the Kapellmeister, or Church Choir Master track, but his first teacher, Hermann Grabner, encouraged him to study composition and church music instead. Ursula Hermann, who wrote the first comprehensive biography of Dissler, writes, Dissler, who always thought equitably, simply could not understand that his talent and diligently acquired capabilities were insufficient to meet the admission requirements of the Nuremberg Conservatorium. He was convinced that his somewhat unusual family circumstances contributed to this negative decision. Obviously, the inferiority complex that existed in him already in early childhood was reinforced through this circumstance. And in 1930, the position of organist became open at the Jacobi Kirche in Lübeck, which is a small Hanseatic city near the Black Sea. Lübeck arrived on the musical map in the early 1700s as the home of composer Dietrich Buxtehude, who was the organist at the Marienkirche, the large Roman Catholic cathedral in the city, where Johann Sebastian Bach would study with Buxtehude. Dissler arrived at the Jacobi Kirche to be the organist, a position he won after a very politically charged search. The search committee was searching along, and they had a tie. All of the musicians wanted Dissler. All of the church leaders wanted another organist. The pastor wanted Dissler, so they actually drew straws, and Dissler won the position. How would you like your first job to have been received instead of your interview by, oh, we'll pick this one. <laughs> when he arrived at Jacobi Kirche, he found the music library to be lacking and in quality and in substance. One of his first duties was to sort through this music library, and he did something that every church choir director, I think, wants to do when they get to their new church libraries. He writes, at this time, I did something before I realized the practical consequences. I have since learned better, however. This was the first step to self-responsibility to the demands of my profession. I threw out the rubble, that is, I burned all of the rubbish after first saving for myself one sample score from the flames for permanent inglorious memory and the chaos that I found and from which I started my work. He took his entire music library and started over. 
So in April of 1931, Distler began composing a series of chorale-based motets for his volunteer choirs. And that's important to note is that he only had volunteer choirs, unlike the paid choirs in many of the other churches in Germany of the day. He had a children's choir, a boy choir, and a volunteer adult choir, all of them very similar to the church choirs we have in our churches today. Just a couple definitions. A chorale is the congregational hymn of the German Protestant service. The chorale is a pairing of a metrical text with a specific tune. Unlike the hymns in English, which are somewhat interchangeable, the hymn is the text, the hymn tune is the tune. And a motet is a sacred polyphonic, or for multiple voices, composition, which may or may not have instrumental accompaniment. This is the framework which Dissler used to write Der Jahrkreis. Dissler wrote music for everyday use, and because the German language has a word for everything, Gebrauchsmusik. Gebrauchsmusik is a term that encapsulates this idea that there are two types of music. Music that is meant to be listened to, and music that is for practical everyday use. In the case of choral music, this distinction falls between music for the concert hall and music written to be performed by casual and amateur musicians. We're now going to sing one of the examples of his practical service music, the Te Deum, Lord God, We Praise You, which is a perfect example of his Gebrauchsmusik. He wrote this for the practical purpose of use during the Lutheran evening service. Herr Gott, dich loben wir. Herr Gott, wir danken dir. Dich, Vater, in Ewigkeit, Deum, the single voice portion of the verse can either be sung as solo or choir. This is exactly what Disler writes in the preface to Der Jahrkreis. It can also be transposed for men's voices, be a responsorial sung by the clergy, the same is true of the Passion Chorale by Stieler Nacht, and similar settings where choir and choir, or choir and solo verse alternate. Also, a solo performance of an entire motet is also possible in some cases. The support of vocal lines on appropriate instruments, either solo or in groups, or substitution of an instrument for an entire vocal part is also recommended, provided that the instruments follow the phrasing of the text. This short statement shows how flexible these arrangements truly are, adhering to the ideals of Gebrauchsmusik. 
It is in this spirit that we are presenting many of these motets tonight. So Dissler noted there were many ways that you could perform these. They can be sung as they're written, transposed for the voices you have available, be accompanied by any number of instruments doubling or replacing parts. Several of the motets also have instrumental interludes or ritornelli in between verses as introductions, as transitions to parts of the service. They can be performed by treble voices with the choir master or conductor singing the lowest part, which Dissler often did with his children's choir. Or you can use a text that is appropriate to the season or occasion as long as the poetic meter and character is retained from the original setting. You'll notice many of the motets that we are singing this evening, we are singing the English translations, which are the exact same English text for these chorales that we use in our hymnals in the United States. And as a matter of fact, all of these things are what we do in our churches today with hymn tunes and texts for practical uses. We'll take them and make arrangements for our choir to sing as the offertory. We'll take a text that's brand new and we'll put it with a tune that's older that congregations are familiar with. These are all things that are well grounded in church tradition. The other way that this is Gebrauchsmusik is that Dissler was paying attention to the year's circle, which is the literal translation of the word Yarkreis, the circle of the year. The liturgical calendar is a, literally written as a circle. In the Protestant tradition, the seasons start with Advent, move into Christmas, going clockwise, Epiphany, Lent, Holy Week, Easter, Pentecost, and the season after Pentecost. In the Roman Catholic tradition, those Sundays after Pentecost are called ordinary time. So our church year begins with Advent, not with the calendar year. Advent begins on a Sunday, which is four Sundays before Christmas Day. Traditionally, this falls either the last Sunday in November or the first Sunday in December. Now we will present one of Dissler's Advent motets, Maria Durch ein Dornwald ging.
production was based on a traditional German Christmas carol. All of the rest of the ones that we are going to be performing are, this evening, are chorale settings. <coughs> However, the book does not contain just chorale settings and a Christmas carol setting. There are also um, original compositions, such as the Te Deum, and there is a set of amens to be used in any service. So the next holiday is Epiphany, which is the 12th day after Christmas, January 6th. This holiday celebrates the arrival of the Magi to the manger. Our next selection from Gary Archrist is a setting of the Epiphany Carol, Wie schön leuchtet der Morgenstern. To give you an idea of how Dissler uses the chorale to create his settings, I would like to now, all of us, sing the original chorale together. So if you could please turn to, in the blue chalice hymnals in the pew in front of you, to hymn number 105, and please join with us as we sing verse 1 of the chorale together. season is the season of Lent, which is the penitential season leading up to Easter. And our next motet that we will sing is from Easter Day. This is a motet for Easter Day. Easter in 1931, when Dissler started writing this music, fell on April 5th which places this Easter motet at the very beginning of the composition of Deriarchreis. So unlike some of the other settings, 
This one's a little bit simpler, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. This is Erschienen ist der Herrlich Tag. Has dawned this dawn. During the Easter season, we have the next holiday, which is Ascension Day. Ascension Day is the, is the day celebrated in high church, in the high Catholic and Lutheran traditions, in which they celebrate the last appearance of Christ to the apostles, where, he, where the apostles see him ascend into heaven, and they truly know that, yes, this is Christ. It is a very large holiday in the church in Europe, not as much here in the United States. And so Dissler wrote our next setting, Nun bitten wir den Heiligen Geist, for that Ascension Day celebration. Immediately following Ascension, which is the holiday 50 days after Easter, is Pentecost Day, celebrating the birth of the church, the first motet which we sang this evening was written indeed for Pentecost Day. So now we'd like to present to you the Ascension Chorale, Nun bitten wir den Heiligen Geist.
After Pentecost Sunday, we then enter into the longest season of the year, the Sundays after Pentecost, or in the Roman Catholic tradition, ordinary time. However, if you are Lutheran, there is one day which stands apart from all others in this season, and that is Reformation Day. For on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther did the unthinkable, walked up to the church in Wittenberg and nailed his 95 theses to the door, telling the Catholic Pope everything he thought was wrong with the Catholic Church. Little did that one monk know that he would spur a Protestant revolution and reformation that would go on for 500 years of inspiring the church to change and grow as the times evolved into the current time. This holiday in the Lutheran church is second only to Easter. You will actually have more people at a Reformation Sunday service than you will on Christmas Day, or sometimes even Easter. That is how important this day is in the Lutheran Church. Dissler worked in this evangelical Lutheran tradition in Germany, so it would only be fitting that he wrote a setting of one of Martin Luther's chorales. This is text and tune by Martin Luther for Reformation Sunday. Ach Gott von Himmel sieh der Rhein, O Lord, look down from heaven, behold.
our final Sunday after Pentecost, is the celebration of Christ the King Sunday. And we return right back to the first Sunday of Advent to start the church year over. And so the fact that the year indeed is a circle makes the motets in Dear Yar Christ even more relevant. Each of the motets can be used each year during the appropriate season, which provided a perfect way for Dissler to use these motets to teach his choir how to sing his music. When Dissler arrived at Jacobi Kirche, he found that his music was too difficult for his volunteer choirs. Now this is only Opus 5, so he had only written four motets to this point, all of which were too difficult for the choirs that he inherited when he became not only the organist but the choir master at Jacobi Kirche. Because his music was very similar to those of his contemporaries, as well as similar to music of the Renaissance and Baroque period that he wished to teach his choir, he had to come up with a way to get his choir to be able to sing the music that he wanted to. Music originally was conceived in the Renaissance and Baroque period especially without bar lines. That is, without specific divisions marking the metric music phrase into even sections. Music was provided in part books. You would see just your own part, and you were expected to shape the musical phrase based on the text and musical lines. Bar lines, or measure lines, which won't show up today, sorry, <laughs> were used only to separate entire phrases, like where you see the word omnes right in the bottom left of the picture. Now, as we went through time, we got some bar lines, some of these measure markings. In this page from the 1893 Collected Works edition of Die Himmel Erzähl in die Ehre Gottes by Heinrich Schütz, who is a Baroque composer from Germany, you see that the editors have arbitrarily added bar lines every four beats with the half note receiving the beat, whether that matches the phrase or not. In the newest Carus Fairlog edition from 1968, which was revived in 1992, the editors went one step further, adding a bar line every two beats with the half note receiving the pulse. This has an adverse effect on the choir, especially one that does not speak the language. For example, note the first text, Die Himmel erzählen die Ehre Gottes. Under modern rules of notation and performance practice, the strongest beat of the measure is always one. So, if we were to perform the first phrase that way, ignoring the text, it would sound something like this. musical is it? Doesn't sound very good, but beat one is strong. The other problem with that is that it doesn't match the German text. The first word in the phrase, D, is the article the. So placing that first strong beat, die Himmel, doesn't work. It's die Himmel erzählen, die Ehre Gottes. Gottes is the important word here, God. God is always the most important word, right? When you're singing sacred music. So this is how you have to work and ignore what's really going on here.
a much more musical phrase, don't you think? When we perform music like this, each individual voice is phrasing their own line based on the text rather than where the bar lines fall. So, given that beat one is always the strongest beat in the measure, here, the thick lines are where the bar lines should actually go to match the text. You can see that in some cases, those thick bar lines do match the arbitrary ones that were put in by the editors. However, most of the arbitrary bar lines don't match the text stress. You can also see that most of the measures are created by the text bar lines are not even. They change based on the text. For example, the contus line, which is the middle line of this example, has a half note pickup, a measure of four, two measures of two, another measure of four, a measure of two, a measure of four, a measure of six, a measure of four, a measure of three, a measure of two, a measure of five, and a measure of four, which does not match the measures of eight quarter notes that the editor set up or either of the lines above and below it. Now, if you can imagine, this is just three voices of a six-voice motet, how complicated these rhythms get going back and forth. This music is referred to as polymetric music, music that is going at different meters at the same time. However, scholars cannot agree on this definition of polymetric music. The New Grove Encyclopedia, which is the standard bearer of music definitions, describes polymetric music as the use of irregular meters when rebarring music of the Renaissance and Baroque period. So polymetric music is doing what I just did by placing the bar lines where they actually belong instead of where the editors decided to put them. Musicologist Johnston London defines polymetry as involving the presence of two or more concurrent metric frameworks. Two different frameworks happening at the same time. Dissler, however, used a new form of polymetric music. Not only having two or more concurrent metric frameworks implied in the music, but he also wrote all of the concurrent meters explicitly in the music which is what I am calling multi-metric polymeter. What does that mean? Well, singers have been singing polymetric music for centuries. However, when you were singing a part book and all you had was your part, and you were phrasing based on the text and the musical line, you had no idea that you were singing in a different meter than your friends across the hall, across the aisle from you. During the classical period, late 18th, early 19th century, music became centered around bar lines and clear metric pulses. This included choral music. During the late 19th century, these new additions, just like you saw with the Die Himmel Erzählen, of Renaissance and Baroque music contained arbitrary bar lines. And as singers began to sing music with these strong metric pulses from the classical period, they then applied these techniques to the arbitrary bar lines from the Renaissance and Baroque period in these new modern editions. As they sang this music with a strong metric accent, they lost their ability to perform the polymetric music. And conductors such as Dissler became very frustrated with the choir's inability to properly perform polymetric music. So let's examine different ways that Dissler used polemetry in his music. Let's go back to our Ach Gott von Himmel sie der Rhein, the Reformation Sunday motet that we just sang. You can see that if you're a music reader, if you're not, I'll explain it. The top line is moving until you get to that 3-4 in four beats per measure. However, the alto line, based on the text and the stress, is moving in groups of three at the same time that the soprano voice is moving in groups of four. Defend thy truth, O God, and stay this evil generation. 
very strong three against the sopranos, which are singing a very strong four. Ladies, could you sing that section one more time for us so we can hear both, both sections? definitely confuses the singers until they realize that they're singing in a different meter than their friends. And altos, in our rehearsal, what did we do? We broke it down into the groups of three, and was it easier? Once you understood that you were singing in a different meter than your friends. Now, however, we move from a simple polymetric notation to a work written in multi-metric polymeter. All right. We're going to perform this in, the, in Dissler's tradition, transposed for men's voice and taking one of our voices and putting it into an instrument. So when you hear it, it sounds pretty simple. Nice, nice harmonies, nothing too difficult. However, the top line changes meter 10 times in 13 measures. The middle part has 11 meter changes in 15 measures. And the bottom part has 7 meter changes in 16 measures. No one line is the same as the other. You have, all you have are these little goal posts where you all land together. So, how did we get here? What is important about Dariarchais? Well, Dariarchais can be used not only during the weekly services, but I think he kind of knew what he was doing. He composed a pedagogical tool to teach his choirs how to sing this polymetric music. The first motets were composed around Easter, which in 1931 was April 5th. Dissler rarely dated his manuscripts, which when you're looking at manuscripts is very difficult sometimes because you're trying to place things in order and you really can't tell when something was written. The one motet that he did date was the cover page of this unpublished motet that we sang at the beginning of the recital. It was dated April 22nd, 1931. And it was a Pentecost motet, which would have fallen on May 23rd of that year. Other of the simplest motets, such as the Erscheinen ist uh, der Herrlich Tag, from the collection that we sang earlier, the Easter motet, were also from this earliest period in the circle where he started. Note he didn't start the circle in Advent, he started the circle in Easter. As we moved throughout the church year, the motets became more difficult. 
the O Highland Rice that we just sang, is an Advent motet. Started in April, by December we were there. Motets that are polymetric appeared starting around Reformation Day, so around the end of October. And the final motets with the multi-metric polymetry appeared during Advent and Epiphany. The 52 motets were originally published in two parts. The first 25 motets form a complete cycle from simple hom homorhythmic motets through to the multi-metric polymetry. And the second set of 25 motets build on this foundation and get more and more difficult. He then uses the multi-metric polemetry that he sets up here in Derriarkreis throughout the rest of his compositional career, especially in the music that he writes for the choirs in Lübeck, his choral passion and uh, the Christmas story, Der Weihnachtsgeschichte. Dissler's composition and teaching was very structured, which makes me strongly believe that Dissler was intentional with the way he composed these motets. Although they were published in the order for the church year, they're not the order that they were composed in. As a matter of fact, preparing for this evening's recital, as we were rehearsing these motets, we did not sing them in the order we, we presented them in this evening. We started with Erschien and Mr. Herrlich Talk, the easiest of the motets, and moved around to the most difficult, Ach Gott von Siederheim. Although they are published in this order, Dissler mentions in his preface that in the beginning, one does well to limit oneself to performing only the easiest settings, noting that the two voice settings are by no means always the easiest to perform. So looks can be deceiving with these motets. Dissler's primary biographers also date Der Jahr Crisis being composed in 1931 to 1932. However, a letter from Dissler to his fiancée, Waltraut Teenhaus, dated October 18, 1932, seems to contradict this idea that the set was complete when the first part was sent to the publisher in late 1932. He writes, Today I finished five motets from the second part of Der Jahrkreis. The second part seems richer and bolder than the first part, but the children like it, despite the harmonies. Despite the modern dissonant harmonies, I have finished a motet for Reformation Day, a prayer text, two All Saints motets, because there is a lack of them. So again, he's writing music to fill the gaps in the church year, and a wedding motet. Tomorrow I'm beginning the Christmas motets. I want to deliver the second part this year to Baron Rider, for I would not like to leave the work that I have been paid for in advance. The work falls solely on me now, for man depends on money, and a church musician even more so. Dissler would continue his work in Lübeck and then later in Stuttgart and Berlin, but his life was cut tragically short on November 1st, 1942, when he took his own life. In his short 16 creative years, Dissler would compose over 150 short choral works, three keyboard collections, numerous single keyboard compositions, and a variety of longer works for various voicings. Had he lived, Dissler would have easily become one of the most prolific choral composers in history. So now we leave you, having come full circle in the composition of the first part of Der Jahrkreis, with a polymetric Easter motet, Mit Freuden Sart. This evening, I would like to ask you to now turn in your hymnals to hymn number six, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Much in the tradition of Hugo Dissler, using these in different ways, we are going to present the first three verses of this Choral Motet, and we are going to ask you all to rise at, as, I, as you were directed and join in verse four of hymn number six. Mit Freuden Sart.
I, I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. However, I have to first thank all of the wonderful volunteers. This is an all-volunteer group <laughs> from, from George Mason University and my church choir here at Vienna Baptist. So I have to say a special thank you. And Stephen Sollers, who's the music director at St. Peter's in the Woods uh, Parish over in Fairfax Station. So thank you all so much. Obviously, I could not have done this without you, so thank you. <laughs> Anybody has any, if you guys have any questions? Yes. So, uh, I know that you did the archives and study. What would you say to those people? I guess, how would you define it? Other than the piece that had never been published, um, the most exciting find was um, his daughter gave me access to all of his personal correspondence. Um, so, I was. I spent two weeks in Lübeck and Munich and Nuremberg reading letters, reading programs, notes, things that were sent from the family. Um, there is a handwritten note from Dietrich Bonhoeffer mourning the death of Dissler. There is entire, for his choral passion, which is the work that immediately follows, almost immediately follows Der Jahrkreis, um, in that he wrote, he was so meticulous about every little detail in a letter to his fiance who was on vacation in London. He wrote a detailed outline of the composition that he was about to write because he was so excited about it. In a love letter to his fiance. <laughs> um, so that was really the, it was really exciting to see how both how personal he was, because until his daughter wrote a biography about him, the family was so very closed about the, the details of his life. Um, and even now, the only English language biography that's been written on him was a dissertation that was done in 1964 and published as a book in 1969. So being able to really go and learn more about who he was instead of just seeing the music that he produced was really exciting. I guess this is kind of a two-part question. When I was talking to people about um, being a part of this recital, which was so much fun, and thank you so much for letting us do this with you, um, a lot of people had never even heard of Hugo Disler, which I know probably makes you cringe a little bit because he's lived in Greece <laughs> for so long. Uh, I guess my biggest question is, how did you first, what was your first exposure to Hugo Disler, and what made you so passionate that's a great, what was my first exposure to Hugo Dissler? My first exposure to Hugo Dissler was singing one of his polymetric motets, was his um, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. It's a little motet actually written at, it's a contemporary piece to Der Yark, to the later part of Der Yark Reis, um, a motet which my church, my church choir members who are here are nodding because we've done it here. Um, but I actually sang that as part of a choir through the American Choral Directors Association I found it, I was in the middle of preparing a recital, and I went, I have to do something else by Dissler, what can I find? And then I started listening to more and more Dissler, and managed to find the most obscure piece of Dissler that people had not heard of. And I was so amazed that people had not heard these motets, that, and then going in especially to find out that they were written for his church choir, and that they were for three-part voices, because so much I, you know, the bulk of music written for adults in our church choir, upwards of probably 90 or 95 percent, is written for four-part or more voices. So finding this three-part music was really exciting um, and wanted to bring it to the forefront. Unfortunately, with the challenge of the polymetricism in it, you also have to figure out, well, how am I going to get my amateur choir to sing this music that looks different than the music they're used to? And so that's been, my, that's been my journey in the dissertation, is finding out how you can take these and use them to teach your choirs how to sing this music. Because it's not inherently difficult. It's nothing that we haven't sung before, but you know, go to 18 time signatures and 15 measures. 
it sure looks different than what we're used to seeing every day, doesn't it? beyond the project, I'm going to use these motets, even if all we're going to sing them on is neutral syllables or solfege syllables, because it gets the music in your ear very quickly. It's very easy to sing four verses of one of these. Most, I mean, there's not one of them that, I think three of them go to three pages. None of them are that difficult. So they're things that you can use in warm-ups. They're things that you can use in your everyday teaching that don't necessarily have to be performed. And as a church choir director, boy, are we going to sing a couple of these this summer when half of the choir is out on summer vacation. Polyphonic. Polyphonic music is just music for many voices that doesn't fall, that doesn't, in common tradition, it doesn't fall that all of the voices are singing the same rhythm at the same time, which some refer to as homophonic. In this context, I refer to it as homorhythmic. We're all singing the same rhythm at the same time. So polyphonic music can be polymetric. It doesn't have to be. But in the way we think of when we think of polyphonic music as a casual listener, most of it is polymetric because most of that music is from the Renaissance and Baroque. Mm, not really. The contrapuntal is a different technique. Contrapuntal music can be polymetric. Contrapuntal music can be poly polyphonic. Polyphonic music can be, but they're not mutually exclusive. And contrapuntal music is usually for keyboard not voices, instruments. Well, his harmonic, Dr. Robinson asked about his harmonic language. This is very early in his, in his development, harmonically. Again, all of these motets were from part one. The next 25 motets get bolder and richer. When you get into, um, into Weinach's Geschichte, it's a lot of clusters, a lot of things that are very typical of that early 20th century music. Um, Dissler was very much inspired by Hindemith, Paul Hindemith, Karl Orff, who composed Carmina Burana, um, and Wagner, all of the big, heavy, late romantic Wagner, Mahler. Um, in, in the conservatory, he was constantly exposed to these things. He mentions being at one of the very first performances of Carmina Burana when it premiered. Um, in Germany in one of his letters to a friend. So the, those 20th century influences were very big on him. And so what he was doing is he was taking that 20th century harmonic framework and putting this Renaissance and Baroque rhythmic framework at the same time. So where in a Renaissance or Baroque motet you have very strict rules for how dissonances resolve, and Dissler ignores 99% of them. Um, unresolved dissonances, dissonances that resolve the wrong direction, um, open fifths, parallel things, all of the rules that we were taught in music theory. These are the things you never do. Well, he does most of them.
These small motets, I don't know whether it would work with just because they're so small. Um, but the larger pieces, I mean, I have definitely, in rehearsal, um, the, one of the settings from the Weinachsgeschichte, the Lohauer Rose are blooming from the Weinachsgeschichte. It's very, very famous. Choirs sing it all over the place. But when we sang it here, the only way that I could really get the choir to get it was we all sang the soprano line. And then we all sang the alto line. And then we all sang the tenor line. And then we all sang the bass line. And then we started putting them together to find out where our checkpoints were. And I remember in singing, in singing the Schoenberg, you know, that's your important thing is where's my checkpoint? When you're singing this polymetric music, it's like, we're going along, we're going along. Here's my checkpoint. Okay, I'm with everybody. Now I can just pay attention and hyper focus again. Um, who he influenced. Um, the American composer Jan Bender was one of his students. Um, he writes pro prolifically about the influence that Dissler had on him. Dissler spent, he spent almost three whole years in Lübeck with Dissler studying. Um, um, Ernst Pepping is another composer, um, German composer Ernst Pepping. Um, Johann Nepomuk David was a contemporary of his, and they had some, some cross um, influences. Um, he went to school with the film composer Miklos Rosa, the Hungarian film composer. Um, and his, he influenced, I think, a lot of peop people in his teaching. Um, one of the things that I really would like to explore with him is that he wrote a book on functional harmony in the 1930s before functional harmony was a real solid concept in teaching theory. So his pedagogical methods definitely have influenced. Um, his functional harmony book was published 10 years before Hindemith's uh, Principles of Music books. Um, so. That, so he's, although he was very influenced by especially the master composers of the Renaissance and Baroque, his influences are, well, he, you know, having passed at the age of 34, his influences are, I think, a little slower to, to spread out and are in much, much smaller, more, uh, more subtle ways. So Der Jahrkreis was composed entirely before the Nazi regime and SDAP took power. There was a lot of freedom. The evangelical church was flourishing before, and Dissler was a very religious man. It was flourishing before, the, before Hitler took power. And he became a member of the party in 1935 out of pure self-preservation, much like many, many people did, especially artists. Um, he worked for the state conservatory. So he was having all of these, all the way through the Nazi regime, he was being pulled in two directions between his faith that knew that none of this was right and the, I have to do these things just to keep moving forward. Um, he was conscripted into the army twice and got two um, deferments. The second deferment came to his home on November 2nd, 1942, the day after he committed suicide, his second and final exemption from the army. So a lot of, a lot of people who work around Dissler think that that may have been a big influence um, he had relatives who had died already in World War II. He had friends, obviously, that were, you know, Hindem I mean, he had become, 
he had studied a little bit with Hindemith as he passed through. So he had all of these friends who were fleeing Germany. He knew people who were in the concentration camps. So there was a lot of stress on him at that point. And in his, in his, um, in his final letter to his wife, he does write about how he, he uses the, the um, I'm not going to use the Bible, the, the reference, because I can't remember it exactly, but it's one of the phrases from, he was in the middle of preparing the Schutz's Musikalische Exequium, which is Schutz's German Requiem. And he uses in his letter a passage that appears in the Exequium about how death sets us free. So I think he saw that as freedom at that time. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all again for coming.